dear Cambridge Union members and uh, Cambridge University Russian Society members, I would like to introduce to you Mikhail Kodakovsky, uh, a Russian opposition politician and a reformer. Uh, Mikhail is well known for being one of the most prominent opponents and critics of Putin and the Putin regime in Russia. His most recent book, How to Slay a Dragon, maps out the future of post-Putin Russia and presents a vision of a potential democratic transition in our country. Um, joined by the Russian Democratic Society today, we invite you to uh, contribute to the fundraising campaign to provide Ukrainian hospitals with medical equipment in our attempt to deal with the consequences caused uh, by the Russian war of aggression in Ukraine. Uh, I would like to give the word to Mikhail now. Good afternoon, thank you for this invitation. Can you hear me there in the back? Because I'm actually used to talk without a mic. Я постараюсь сейчас сформулировать некоторые тезисы, некоторые из которых вам покажутся очевидными, другие нет. I'll try to formulate a number of points. Some of them might seem obvious to you, others would not. И оставлю их раскрытие на ваше усмотрение. Хотите зададите вопрос? And to unpack them, it's really up to you. If you wish, you could ask me questions about them. Постоянный вопрос, который мне задают, это есть ли у российской оппозиции видение будущего и есть ли у российской оппозиции видение перехода. So I'm constantly asked the same question: whether the Russian opposition have a vision of the future. And also whether the Russian opposition has a vision of transition to that future. Короткий ответ есть, и у большей части демократической оппозиции оно в целом совпадает. In short, yes, they do, and for the majority of the democratic opposition, their views coincide. It's a similar kind of view vision. Есть один вопрос дискуссионный. На теоретическом уровне я о нем расскажу. There is a point of debate, theoretically, and I'm going to cover it too. И есть несколько типов радикальных взглядов, о некоторых из них я тоже упомяну. And there are also some radically held views that I'm going to mention as well. Российская демократическая оппозиция недавно собралась в Берлине и приняла декларацию, которая согласилась, по крайней мере, по трем пунктам. There was a recent gathering of the Russian Democratic Opposition in Berlin, and they adopted a declaration in which they, their views converged at least on three areas. Война агрессивная, развязавший ее режим преступный, Украина в границах 1991 года. So this is an aggressive war. The regime that has unleashed this war is a criminal regime, and Ukraine has to go back to the uh, borders of 1991. This wasn't an evident outcome, but if you're interested in details, I'm going to tell you about them. Российской демократической оппозиции также согласились. The key actors of the Russian Democratic Opposition also agreed on the following. Будущее России парламентская республика. The future of Russia is a parliamentary republic. Будущее России сильный федерализм. The future of Russia lies in strong federalism. И сильное местное самоуправление. And also in strong local government. То есть это означает децентрализацию страны. To sum up, it is the decentralization of the country. На самом деле это тоже не самые очевидные пункты. But indeed, these were not the most obvious outcomes either. Но пока без подробностей. But at the moment, I'm not going to give you the details. 
of the debates. This transition is going to happen with, with and by violence, or at least with the threat of using violence. На эту тему были серьезные дискуссии, но это в определенном смысле общее мнение. There were heated debates about this particular point, but in general it's a common understanding among the opposition. Переход займет 2-3 года, после которых только будут возможны честные выборы. The transition will probably take 2-3 years, after, only after those 2-3 years fair elections would be possible. Есть общее понимание, что на будущие 20-30 лет уровень демократии в различных регионах России будет различным. There is also common understanding that in the forthcoming 20 to 30 years the level of democracy in different parts of Russia is going to be different. Вопрос взаимоотношений с Украиной будет одним из ключевых. And one of the key issues is going to be the issue of relations with Ukraine. And now the uh, points of debate. So one part of the opposition thinks that the transition should be uh, managed by one uh, revolutionary party with uh, people supporting it and sort of accompanying it. So when we talk about those fellow travels, what do we mean? These are the people who are going to be uh, executing the orders of this revolutionary party. Only then a transition to democracy would be possible. Whereas the other part of the opposition, and I belong to that part, think that the transition should be uh, administered by a coalition straight away. То есть система сдержек и противовесов должна осуществляться уже в процессе перехода. So the system of checks and balances has to be uh, installed straight away in the process of that transition. This might appear a theory, but in fact there are serious consequences of how you look at it today. So again, if you have an interest in hearing more about it, we can talk about it. And now about the radical positions held by some. The radical position is that Russia has to basically stop existing. This is a view held by Ukrainian politicians, some of the Ukrainian politicians, and also some of the politicians of neighboring countries, uh, the, Baltic States, uh, the Baltic States and Poland. So there is a part of radical Russian opposition who support this view. I and the majority of Russian opposition think that this way is too dangerous. But again, we can discuss it, if you want. В моей книге рассмотрены э, и другие аспекты этого э, перехода. And my book considers other aspects of that transition. Э, книга «Как убить дракона» она писалась вообще для, исключительно для российской аудитории. In fact, my book «How to Slay a Dragon» was written exclusively for the Russian audience. Она такая, знаете, непривычно для западного уха прямая. It's too direct for a western ear. Вот. Но потом оказалось, что а, 
западные издатели хотели бы ее пере, переиздать на других языках. And then it turned out that publishers in the West wanted to publish it translated into other languages. So I, we had to cut it down. <laughs> so if you want to read it in full, you have to read it in Russian. For instance, we consider the issues of underground or immigration. How to put an end to the war. Illustration or improvement, correction. What do we understand by left wing and right wing and the transition to the left vis-a-vis -vis Russia? The choice between an empire or the national state, nation state, sorry. Справедливость или милосердие. Uh, justice or uh, forgiveness. Uh, это все вопросы, которые относятся к процессу перехода. So these are all issues which are linked with the transition. И если какие-то из них вас заинтересуют, можете прочитать, ну или если успеем, то здесь можно обсудить. So again, if you're interested in any of these issues, you can read the book yourselves, or if you want, we can start discussing them here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mikhail. Um, we are re really glad to see you here, especially the Cambridge University Russian Society. And I would like to ask a question, um, and I will ask it in Russian as well, but first in English. I've been hearing a lot from Russian political scientists that the natural tendency of the Russian society is being isolationist, and that uh, the future of Russia will be that of a country that wouldn't be open to foreigners. Uh, do you agree with that position? Uh. Россия, как и любая другая большая страна, во многом автократична. Uh, uh, like any other large country, Russia is largely autarchic. Uh, если вы посмотрите на Соединенные Штаты, не на Нью-Йорк, и не на Лос-Анджелес, а вот на реальные Соединенные Штаты, вы увидите тоже, в общем, какую замкнутость на себя. So, for instance, if you consider the United States, let's not take New York or Los Angeles, but the whole of the United States, you can see that it's also some kind of a closed entity. And I'll give you uh, a joke. Well, I'll give you a sort of a, It's not a joke, it's a case, in, in, a sort of case, an example from mine. So, my colleague and I traveled to Texas. Идем в аэропорту, проходим мимо полицейского, разговариваем на русском. So we were actually passing a policeman in the airport talking Russian. We were talking Russian. Он нам говорит, ребята, вы британцы? And the guy says to us, are you from the UK? Я говорю, мы спрашиваем, а почему ты решил, что мы британцы? And I said to him, why do you think we are British? Ну вы говорите на каком-то языке, я вас не понимаю. He said, because you're talking a language I don't understand. But of course, artificially isolating a country would be idiotic. And of course, there are very few people in Russia who would support such an idea. Hello everyone, I hope the audience excuse me, I will ask a question in, in Russian to better explain what I actually would like to ask. Uh, uh, Mikhail Marisovich, uh, in 1996, uh, 
элиты из добрых побуждений или из коммерческих побуждений не дали, ну, по крайней мере, провести максимально возможно честные выборы, потому что посчитали, что для людей и для России будущего будет лучше, чтобы Ельцин оставался у власти. So back in 1996, и вы сейчас очень много говорите о том, что нужно провести выбор, дать людям выбор. У меня, наверное, к вам вопрос. В большей степени человеческий. А, а что будет, если людям дать выбор, и они выберут не то, что вы хотели бы, или там, как вы видите лучше для будущего России, потому что ну, они к этому не готовы, ни к какой демократии, ни к чему. So my question to you is, okay, you say that people should be given the choice to hold fair and free elections. What will happen if these people choose something which is not very palatable, because they're just not ready for democracy, they don't want it? Спасибо. Два тезиса. So, two points here. На второй отвечу, с первым не согласен. I will answer your second point, and I do disagree with the first one. Поскольку я непосредственно принимал участие в событиях 96 -го года, то я вам могу рассказать, что вот то восприятие, которое вы, видимо, извлекли из литературных источников, оно не, не, не совсем верно. Well, first of all, because I was actually participating in the events of 1996, I can tell you that your perception, which you must have read about, is not quite the reality that it was. Uh, have you ever heard about the so-called letter of the 13? Frankly speaking, no. <laughs> well, Google it. We wrote a letter to Yeltsin and Zyuganov We suggested that they, they should not fragment the country, they should find a common denominator, they should agree on something. Yeltsin должен был остаться президентом, а Зюганов он должен был номинировать как премьер-министр. And the outcome would be Yeltsin remains president, Zyuganov is named the prime minister. Мы считали, что это создаст ту систему сдержки противовесов, которая была потеряна в 93-м году. We thought this would uh, recreate the system of checks and balances that was lost back in 1993. Uh, к сожалению, мы не получили ответа на это письмо. Unfortunately, Yeltsin did not deign us with an answer. And then, later on, a group of three people were supporting, so standing by Yeltsin. Koržakov, His personal bodyguard, Korzhakov. The director of, of the FSB, the Russian Secret Services, Borsukov. And the deputy premier Soskovets, prime minister, deputy prime minister. And they suggest that the emergency situation should be declared in Russia, communist, the Communist Party should be banned, and the elections should not be held. Yeltsin в одном шаге от того, чтобы согласиться с этим. And Yeltsin was just a step away from agreeing to that proposal. И вот тогда мы пришли к нему вместе с Чубайсом. And then Chubais uh, and us, у вас несколько people, yeah. several people together with Chubais, went to see Yeltsin. Was it seven that they write, like Sibipan Kirshin, I mean? Uh, <laughs> it wasn't seven people, no. Not seven bankers. <laughs> this is something altogether different. Uh, 
It was Berezovsky's idea, the idea of seven bankers. He wanted to show that he was a very influential person, underpinned by half of Russia's wealth. Let's just not take any, any take any note of that. As you know, uh, during uh, their verdict in the British courts, the, um, basically the judge said that he hasn't, had never seen such a lie in, his, in her life as Berezovsky. So basically, uh, going back to the story we were discussing, Chubais had the same effect on Yeltsin as the python would have on a rabbit. But Yeltsin was not ready to part with power. Yeltsin was saying to Chubais, this is the essence of their discussion, I can only hold on to power if I introduce emergency rule. Whereas Chubais retorted, you can win the elections anyway. So neither were discussing Zyuganov actually taking power. So basically the idea was either Yeltsin introduces emergency rule or he wins the elections with preserving some of the democratic procedures, democratic mechanisms. In fact, we had no chance of offering anything else, and the letter of the 13 that Yeltsin simply ignored is a case in point. And answering your second question is what I tell my friends in the democratic opposition is that during those first elections, fair and free elections, people are going to be elected who you and I are not going to like at all. This is why the checks and balances is the situation of greatest concern to us. We have to create that. This would allow us to take power maybe in second or third iteration. Unfortunately, I won't be part of that government because Russia is not the United States and when you're 78, there is nothing you can do in power in Russia.
Uh, what are your current views on uh, territorial integrity of Russia? And how do you reconcile this centralization with potential risks of this integration? I think there is, it's very problematic when you simplify points. The interview that you're referring to, where I spoke in favor of territorial integrity of Russia vis-à-vis -vis North Caucasus, the North Caucasus. Was basically based on the following premise. When here in the UK, people talk about separation of part of the UK from the rest of the UK, let's take Scotland. They mean that this, is going, this decision is going to be taken by well-informed people. And this decision is going to be taken by democratic methods. I think the younger generations in the UK have forgotten what actually took place in the UK a few decades ago. When there was an attempt to split the UK undemocratically, part of it tried to split away undemocratically. I'm talking about Margaret Thatcher's rule and one of the episodes which people don't like to remind themselves of. The IRA hunger strike. Do you remember how it ended? There is a much tougher debate going on in Russia at the moment. There is a Kadyrov's group of thugs which is basically uh, holding hostage the whole population of Chechnya, of the Chechen Republic. So let's imagine the situation, the very largely decreased prosperity of the people. A significant part of the population still believing in United Russia. And then the army for whom the disintegration of the country would be a big blow both to their well-being and their own perception of themselves. This would be a perfect breeding ground for a dictator. Any dictator would come and unite this fragmented country immediately. And then, 
ему нужно будет продемонстрировать людям, что он наказал тех, кто к этому привел. And then in order to hold on to power, he would have to demonstrate to the population that he or she have punished those who started the whole story. А кто это? А это соседи России. And he or she would say, and who are these people? Oh, they are Russian, Russia's neighbors. So this is a very dangerous idea indeed. misunderstanding here or lack of understanding. The West has so grown used to the using the word oligarchs that people in the West think that really this is the case in Russia. What do we mean by oligarchs? Oligarchs who combine are people who combine political and economic power. So what was the conclusion made? We're going to put some pressure on the oligarchs. They in turn would put some pressure on Putin and this would put an end to the war. They have put pressure on the oligarchs. The war hasn't stopped. Why do you think it hasn't? Because you cannot have a dictatorship and oligarchy at the same time, either one or the other. There are no oligarchs in Russia. All there are are Putin's agents. Это те люди, которые по поручению Путина а, оказывают воздействие, в том числе, на западные элиты для решения тех задач, которые перед ними ставит Путин. These are the people who are Putin's agents, and on his instructions they are also putting pressure on Western elites in order to uh, fulfill the objectives that Putin has set them. В том числе Абрамович. In, Абрамович is one of them. А, какова их судьба? So, what is their destiny? What is their fate? Those of them who help Putin in his aggressive war are in fact putting themselves among the ranks of war criminals. I think the tribunal in the Hague will decide their fate. Those of them who have found it in themselves to stand away from what is happening. Or have joined the ranks of those who are you know, supporting the just cause in this war. We'll have the chance in court to tell about that. And perhaps the court will not pass a you know, ruling against them. But there is inevitably going to be a consideration in court about the uh, life of every person who has not 
uh, split away from Putin, who has not clearly said what their position is vis-à-vis -vis this war. It's clear that they are going to have to answer uh, in court. Okay, we probably have time for just two more questions. And yeah, we're going to do that one too. So like that one and then the other one at the front, somebody at the front. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm curious what you think of the new so-called friendship with no limits uh, between Russia and China. And obviously there are limits. I mean, given the troubled history of uh, Sino-Russian relations, I mean, how do you see this evolving over the coming years? Thank you. on a trip to China. Before that, I had a 10-year ban from visiting uh, China. I had that ban because back in 1991, I visited Taiwan. I was one of the first Russian businessmen to visit Taiwan. And then I basically was put under a ban by China, visiting China. Both Chinese entrepreneurs and the Chinese government, the elite, uh, a peculiar sort. Uh, they don't practice the win-win approach. Of uh, China, etc. 
If you look at the middle of China, you can see that the population density there is not that high. I haven't checked the facts, you can do it for me, but they say that population density in the UK is higher than that in China. But what the Chinese really do want is to have Russia as their sort of petrol station. And Russian, the Russian population understand it well. So even today, this rather pro-Chinese stand of Putin is not particularly popular in Russia. Yet, if you look at the Russian population, it's not a very populated or densely populated country. And the Russian GDP is only 10% of the Chinese or the European Union's GDP. So any sensible Russian government would try and maneuver between the two. Unfortunately, this is our destiny. Я из центра Сибири, поэтому имею право, так сказать, задать Михаилу Борисовичу несколько вопросов, что я знаю Михаила Борисовича его деятельность на протяжении множества, множества лет, и я знаю судьбу Венки и Ванкура в частности, и поэтому душа, конечно, у меня с Михаилом Борисовичем. Окей, so I am from the center of Siberia, so I'm going to ask this question to Mikhail Borisovich because I've been following what he's been doing for many, many years. And of course, the fate of the Venki and the Vankus is something which is very close to my heart. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and, uh, um, I understand that uh, the main part of I understand where Mikhail Boris is coming from, that a lot of these things are still very close to his heart, he still thinks about the past and what's happened, and, and the, 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 the fairness, the, the issue of justice is very much uh, high on his list of priorities. Ну, просто чисто по-женски, вот, по, так сказать, по, работе, по деловому, можно сказать, разговору, я, у меня возникает вот такой вопрос, да, то есть сейчас Михаил Борисович говорит о том, что предстоит большая работа. Окей, но просто как человек к человеку, я имею вопрос к вам, Михаил Борисович. Вы говорите, что есть много, что должно быть сделано и он говорит о том, что вот необходимо формирование новой парадигмы, так сказать, вот мышления российского населения. And you're also saying that you need to form a new paradigm in the mindset of the Russian population. But you say that the people have to be informed, and we know that this is a zero level, the starting point, before you start actually forming some kind of uh, paradigm of a mindset. So you are saying about many, many years of work before people would actually have the informed idea of how to make their democratic choice. Because I think it's not allowed to leave it on a chaotic decision. It's necessary step by step to form so basically you cannot just leave it uh, out to chaos. You have to step by step build a mature electorate. They have to be mature and well informed. I know the situation from the inside and I know that not everybody in Russia are ready to make the democratic choice today.
И поэтому я понимаю, что у Михаила Борисовича есть какая-то, вероятно, модель демократических выборов и формирования государства на демократической основе. Однако, как я понимаю, что существует некое видение работы, видимо, какого-то коллектива. И мне бы хотелось узнать, вот Михаил Борисович как себя представляет в виде какого лидера, потому что вот у него есть очень... Больное, как бы болезненное прошлое, но ведь необходимо формирование оптимистичное, да? оптимистичного взгляда. И совершенно необходимо формирование коллектива с оптимистичным, обычным взглядом. Looking forward, you have to be optimistic despite all the difficulties and problems of the past, which may make one or pessimistic rather about the future Russia. Я как человек могу сказать, что вот таких лидеров и таких, ну, скажем, зрелых и мощных личностей, как Михаил Борисович, не так много. And I also want to say that. Я свое вот как бы почтение, ему выражаю уважение, и просто хочу спросить он как себя видит, как каким лидером? Okay, and basically I say that people like uh, Mikhail Baric Kodarkovsky are for few and far between, people with a mature democratic approach. So what kind of leader does he consider himself and, or, uh, and see for, for, for Russia? This is the key issue, and this is exactly our part and parcel of the debate that the Russian democratic opposition are holding today. Unfortunately, the Americans, who have quite a huge influence on, on the events today, have already made an idea of how life in Russia should be structured and the future of Russia should be shaped. So they have this idea that this czar today is a bad one. So all we need to do is look for a good one. Который сформирует вокруг себя демократическую команду. And that new czar is going to form a democratic team around them. И поведет Россию к светлому демократическому будущему. And take Russia into the bright democratic future. Беда. That's a problem, a real problem. I've made an experiment. The pseudo-sociological experiment. I went to the United States to meet a number of American politicians. And I suggested a kind of thought experiment to engage in. I said to them, just imagine tomorrow you're going to be Russia's president. And you have to explain to people living in Vladivostok in the far east of Russia and to people living in Kaliningrad, bordering uh, western part of Russia, that they have to pay 60% of their taxes and give them away to the federal center of Russia. Because if you don't 
лидер, вождь, власть свою потеряете. If you don't uh, succeed in persuading them to do that, you will lose power as a leader. Такой эксперимент у нас был, господин Горбачев, так сказать, результат известен. We've already had this experiment in our history, Mr. Gorbachev, and you know the results. Uh, because the, the reasons are clear, you have to take money from some of the regions in order to redistribute it and donate it to other regions. And that's the only way to keep all these different regions together in an integrated whole. So I asked the politicians in the United States, what would your decision be? How would you solve this problem? What are you going to do? I spoke to four politicians. So some faster, some slower, but all of them, within 10 minutes, found a solution. The former uh, vice, uh, uh, vice um, uh, head of the American administration, presidential administration, found a solution within one minute. He said, an outside enemy, of course. There is no other solution. You have to create an outside enemy. Because if you want to have centralized government, irrespective of whether it's democratic or authoritarian, you need to create or to have an outside enemy. And that is not China, for sure. Because given the size of the Russo-Chinese border and the size of China, you have to be an idiot to call China your enemy. So what is the solution indeed? To agree to the point, to the fact that neither we nor our children will see a united democratic Russia. We might see a very democratic Moscow and St. Petersburg. Maybe Yekaterinburg as well. And a sprinkling of other cities. Well, Krasnoyarsk, Voronezh, Krasnodar will not be so democratic. And the so-called electoral sultanates there, so-called in Russia, uh, will be completely undemocratic. And there are 15 million people living in those sultanates. And we'll still have to find a consensus among all these different electorates. How to do that? To combine a parliament parliamentary republic with federalism. And also put pressure from the grassroots through local government. There is no other option, unfortunately. I've often used this example when uh, a head of a very large company uh, would find it very difficult uh, when they start to try and govern even a small town. Uh, 
ou son nom. So when you manage your company, you just say, look, I've got this idea. Are you with me or not? Если вы со мной, вперед. If you're with me, let's go forward. Если вы не со мной, идите на рынок, найдите себе компанию, которая вам понравится. If you are not like-minded, like myself, go out into the market and find a different company that you like more. И вот мы вместе идем туда, куда я лидер компании вижу. So as head of company, we together, I lead you somewhere which I can see in my vision and we move there together. А кто со мной не согласен, пожалуйста, скажите, работайте в другой компании. And those who disagree, please go and work for another company. Если я ошибаюсь, вон конкуренты, они меня из рынка. If I'm wrong, there are always competitors who will completely squeeze me out of that market. Теперь я руковожу городом. So imagine now I am head of a town. За меня проголосовало 51 процент. 51 percent of its residents have voted for me. 49 против. And 49 were against. Я могу им сказать, что вы собираетесь манатки и уезжаете из этого города. Can I say to the 49 percent of residents, okay, take up your things and leave this town? Нет. Я я должен найти решение, чтобы 98 процентов населения I'd have to find a solution with which 98% of the population or residents of that town would agree. This means, A, I cannot move forward as fast as I want. And B, I cannot move directly in the direction I want to follow. And when you're a leader of a large country, the only way to cope with this situation is to have a parliament. Where people in parliament could agree between themselves what should be the path we should all follow together. Пропустить это через голову одного человека просто невозможно. It is impossible to get it through a mind of one person, one individual. И что делает Путин? So what is Putin doing in this situation? Расскажу анекдот. I'll give you an anecdote. Но это уже действительно чёрт. Oh, this is a joke. А человек придумал машинку для стрижки волос. Someone has invented an implement to cut your hair. Basically, you stick your head into that implement, and this machine gives you a haircut. So the journalist asks the inventor, "Well, how can it work? Because people's sizes, so head sizes, are all different, and shapes are different." The inventor says, "Yes, before the first haircut." So the national idea, with the exception of war, would be you all live well within your own home. I think quite a suitable idea. Sorry, we cannot hear you because you're not using the mic. Uh, thank you, Mar uh, Thank you very much, Mikhail, for such a loud discussion and for your speech today. Uh, thanks to everyone who had the opportunity to ask questions. We are coming to an end now. Uh, behind you, there's a stall with merchandise uh, that you can buy if you wish to. Uh, all the proceeds from sales will go to our fundraising campaign to provide Ukrainian hospitals with uh, medical equipment. Also, um, there's a QR code uh, on the wall that you can scan and donate money directly if you wish to. Uh, that's all for today. Thank you very much. Also, also, I wanted to add that if you're interested, you can buy a copy of uh, Michael Persevich.
book which you mentioned today. How do you slay the dragon? How do you slay the dragon? Thank you very much.